My name is Aaron Orkin, and I'm a public health and emergency physician here at the Division of Clinical Public Health at the Dalalana School. Today I'm going to be talking about the gap between clinical practice and public health and the really exciting work here at the University of Toronto to close that gap. There's a chasm that divides the world of clinical practice and public health. On the one hand, we have the world of clinical practice, where as a culture, as a society, as a civilization, we've created institutions, professionals, and settings where we look after individuals who have health needs, where we aim to provide empathic, compassionate, and effective care to heal that suffering. On the other side, we have the public health community that aims to address the needs of populations, to prevent disease, to understand and surveil disease, and to treat disease often before it happens at the community level. This chasm, I want to argue uh, today, is a chasm that has essentially reached its limitations, where the most interesting problems and the biggest challenges of our time are problems that cannot be solved on, in either of these communities on their own. Clinical public health is the emerging field established to try to understand and bridge this chasm. Clinical public health is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious application of pop population health approaches to care for individual patients and design health systems. This is no small challenge. On the right, we have a picture there of a community, of a crowd. It's often challenging when we see uh, epidemiological analyses of populations to remember that each one of those people represents an individual story, represents an individual sets of need, set of needs, and represents an individual set of challenges and individual understandings of the health problems that we might be counting. On the other side of the picture, on the left side, uh, we see a representation of clinical care where we often forget that an individual person's needs represent often a trajectory that uh, is symbolic of a population and where population health approaches might have been more effective to prevent or address the needs of the individual ailment. Behind all this, though, there's some myths. There's some real myths that suggest that these two worlds are completely apart and that one approach might be better or different than the other. I want to go through two of those biggest myths and then explore some of the key opportunities for clinical public health to address some of our biggest challenges these days. The first is the myth that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This first comes forward as an adage. It's something that almost everybody has heard before. But it's more than that. It's also a testable hypothesis. So let's go on to the next slide here. This is where this statement came from. This is Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, the, uh, one of the uh, key founders of the uh, United States of America, a signatory to their Declaration of Independence, wrote this adage first in a uh, announcement in a newspaper where he said, as an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, I would advise them to take care how they suffer living coals in a full shovel. What could prevention and cure have to do with living coals in a full shovel? Let's go on. To be carried out of one room into another, for scraps of fire may fall and make no appearance until midnight. When your stairs being in flames, you may be forced, as I once was, to leap out of your windows and hazard your necks to avoid being oven roasted. What was Benjamin Franklin talking about? Turns out that this article that he wrote in uh, a newspaper uh, in the 1700s was a plea for better public health approaches to fire safety. The sorts of interventions that we continue to work on today as a public health community. Every fire alarm in our home, every uh, fire extinguisher that we see in a public setting, every time there's uh, sprinklers in the building that you might be sitting in right now, these are results of smart public health legislation and community-wide efforts to uh, prevent fires and prevent fire-related deaths rather than having to treat them. Back in Benjamin Franklin's time, in homes that were heated with wood, uh, wood stoves, in order to warm up your bed in the coals of winter in New England, people would often put a few warm coals inside a metal shovel and carry them to their bedroom in order to warm up the bed sheets before they got in there. And Benjamin Franklin once, 
in his own experience, had his house laid up on fire and was woken in the middle of the night to discover his house was on fire because one of those coals had slipped out of his pan onto the stairs, lit it on fire, and now he was in trouble. And he argued that preventing this with far better approaches to fire safety would be worth a pound of cure. And he actually here is giving us a hypothesis. An ounce and a pound have a ratio. He's arguing that an ounce which there's 16 ounces in a pound, that there's a ratio of one to 16 in terms of the value of prevention and cure. Turns out, we move on to the next slide, that this is a testable hypothesis. What is the value ratio between prevention and cure? Just a few centuries later, in the same area as Benjamin Franklin first wrote this statement, a publication was made of Cohen and colleagues in, once again, the New England Journal of Medicine. Cohen and colleagues searched for all available qu uh, dollar to quali ratios, or Q-A-L-Y. And as you'll learn, these uh, qualies are quality adjusted life years. So the cost of an intervention in order to add one quality adjusted life year to a person's life. They found 1,500 such published ratios and they divided them into the preventive rate uh, interventions and what we call terti tertiary or secondary treatments, which are essentially efforts to cure. They found 279 published a dollar per quality ratios for preventive interventions and 1,221 1 curative uh, treatments. They then took all of those, uh, those numbers and looked at uh, a comparison between whether or not uh, preventive interventions or treatments were cost effective. On this graph we have a distribution of the cost effectiveness ratios for preventive measures and for treatments for existing conditions. All the way on the left hand set of bars we have those that are actually cost saving where you when you use this intervention you actually save money per life year. All the way on the uh, right hand side we have interventions where it increases cost and where you actually spend money and it, it does no good, it worsens health. In between, we stretch all the way from things that are less than $10,000 per quality adjusted life year through to things that cost over a million. The preventive interventions are in dark blue and the treatments or efforts to cure are in light blue. If you're anything like me and anything like the authors, I, I see no pattern here. Essentially, we find that preventive interventions and curative interventions when it comes to studying them in terms of quality adjusted life years, cost just about the same amount and that there are no over overwhelming weighting towards savings on preventive interventions and costs on curative interventions. So here we have a test of Benjamin Franklin's own hypothesis. And what the authors have found is that in fact an ounce of prevention is worth roughly an ounce of cure. That of the things that we've bothered to study and bothered to figure out the cost per quality adjusted life year, the things seem pretty much neck and neck. Prevention and cure is not a 16 to 1 ratio, but roughly a 1 to 1 ratio. So we conclude that an ounce of prevention is worth roughly an ounce of cure, and I'd, I'd challenge you to take this forward through your public health training, because you'll find this coming up again and again, saying that prevention is the way to go, because curing is more expensive. And that's a testable hypothesis, and it turns out just not to be true. The second myth is the idea that if we prevent disease, we won't have to treat it. This hypothesis, which is really quite common in uh, the public health community, basically suggests that we have dominant illnesses and ailments in our society, and if we could prevent them, we wouldn't have to treat them at all, that people could be healthier and healthier and healthier until finally, unless you believe in immortality, they would die from a state of health. This concept actually has a name. The idea is, the comp is called the compression of morbidity, and here you have the image from the original paper that proposed this concept, and proposed it again as a testable hypothesis. On the top uh, lifespan, call it, and they call it here the prototypic lingering of chronic illness, you have a lifespan where you might have somebody who first gets pneumonia and then they get better. They get treated, it gets fixed. And then as they age, they start to uncover chronic diseases. And they spend roughly the time between, let's say, 40 years old until uh, they die, somewhere around 80 years old, uh, with ever-increasing rates of chronic disease where they require more and more treatment. They spend a huge portion of their life with what we call morbidity. The ideal circumstance that I think many of us would dream of 
would be one where we compress this morbidity, where we spend much less of our long life with illness, where we have a long and healthy life, and only a very brief period towards the end where we experience any chronic illness whatsoever. The question is, as society continues to live longer and longer, as we go from, uh, from populations that have life expectancies under 40 to populations that have life expectancies well over 80, are we witnessing the compression of morbidity where people spend more and more time healthy, or are we witnessing something else? This, again, is a testable hypothesis. And Crimmins and colleagues in 2008 uh, put together an effort to study this effect between in the previous 10 years, between 1998 and 2008 in the United States. They asked whether there is a compression of morbidity occurring with respect to four major illnesses that they were able to study, or a loss of mobility, so needing mobility aids or personal assistance in order to get out of bed or from A to B. What they found is that during this time, between 1998 and 2008, there was a drop in mortality. This goes along well with what most of us think we would be observing, that society is living longer and longer. But they also found that during this time that the prevalence of, more, of disease or morbidity is rising, that the number of people, even though they're living longer and longer, that have an illness uh, or, one or more illnesses is going up. What they concluded is that Americans spend an ever greater proportion of their lives with morbidity or with immobility. And here's what I found the, the striking conclusion. They write, the compression of morbidity is a compelling idea. People aspire to live out their lives in good health and die a good death without suffering, disease, and loss of functioning. And I'll say here that I agree with these people. I agree with these authors. I strive for a life with, uh, with as little suffering, disease, uh, and illness as possible. But they write, however, compression of morbidity may be as illusory as immortality. We do not appear to be moving to a world where we die without experiencing disease, functioning, functional loss, and disability. I can say that similar studies have found the same effect uh, in Canada, have found the same effect in uh, European uh, populations, have found similar effects in, uh, in Asian populations as societies get healthier and healthier and have longer and longer lifespans. In a sense, getting healthier isn't purely divorced from being sick. As we get healthier as a population and live longer, we actually seem to be spending more of our lives sick. This seems like a total contradiction, like a paradox, but it's true. Healthy populations can use more healthcare than sick ones. In a sense, the healthier we get and the longer we live and the less we suffer with fatal diseases, the more of our lives we spend sick. The healthier we get, the sicker we get. And as a result, for the public health community and the clinical community, as we get healthier as populations, and as we, uh, we create enormous shifts globally towards healthier and healthier civilization, we're going to end up not with fewer and fewer people who need health care, but with more and more demands on health in general. So what kind of actions can we take? What kind of work are people like me in clinical public health uh, working on what kind of issues are we tackling? The first one, and I'm intentionally starting somewhere tough, is that eventually public health has to move from dealing with preventing disease to dealing with challenging questions of what it means to have a population that has disease. All this means that public health can no longer isolate itself from deep and challenging questions that have generally been the work of bedside care. Questions like what is a good death? What is the role of illness in a healthy population? What kind of illnesses are acceptable and appropriate? What kind of suffering is part of life? And what kind of suffering can be completely prevented or extinguished from our experience? Rather than seeking to eradicate disease, clinical public health is about addressing disease as an intrinsic part of the human condition at both the individual level I will suffer, I will die, other people, all of us, will suffer and die. But also at the population level, that we cannot have a society that essentially lives forever. Eventually clinical public health is actually about dealing and questioning the issues of what does it mean at a population level that we are not immortal.
Public health and clinical systems can and must also deal with the social determinants of health. We need to work together, and my example here is one of homelessness, to address not only how we prevent homelessness and prevent poverty, and prevent the ill uh, effects from a health perspective of homelessness and poverty, but also to figure out how do we offer excellent clinical care to people who do experience homelessness. While strong social and public health policy can reduce poverty and reduce rates of homelessness, we can also develop clinical institutions with genuine capacity, with the expertise, to provide excellent clinical care to people who are homeless or underhoused. These are two seemingly separate but desperately needing to be integrated problems. How do we prevent poverty? How do we make it so that as few people or no people are, are uh, impoverished or homeless as possible? while also ensuring that the people in our community who are vulnerable and are homeless or facing poverty can receive excellent clinical care. My last example is of the opioid crisis. This is a, a piece of really quite striking graffiti from Vancouver, uh, counting the death toll from 2016 from opioid overdose. The opioid crisis, which involves both uh, prescribed opioids and illegal substances, is another space where clinical public health practitioners are very active. On the conventional public health side, agencies are essential to reform drug policy and enhance surveillance to build harm reduction services and to push for reforms in some of our most damaging policies. Meanwhile, clinical practitioners are essential to bring harm reduction services to people who use drugs, to respond to opioid overdoses with emergency care, to provide accessible health care services to people who are vulnerable, and to provide advanced addictions care for people who are affected by opioids. These two communities cannot practice and cannot address a problem as complicated as the opioid crisis in isolation. Ultimately, we need real integrators who can think about both the bedside, individual, uh, and empathetic clinical practice while also taking on the complex policy and population health issues that are at the core of the opioid crisis. So I'll take you back to this chasm. Our institutions, both historically and in the present, have mostly been dominated by practitioners and by systems that are designed to maintain this chasm. On the one hand, we have clinical practice focused on individuals and public health focused on preventing disease and working at the community level. I would argue that the most interesting problems of our day and the most pressing problems for our communities are issues that defy this divide. And I invite you to join me in uh, becoming the kind of integrator who can work at the bedside, understand individuals for their uh, unique narrative, and also uh, address problems at the upstream and systematic level. That's clinical public health. Join me here.